everyone, and welcome to the fourth and final session in the Chamber Foundation Sustainability Summit Series. Um, for those of you that have been following pretty consistently, you will now know I'm Stephanie Potter. I lead the Sustainability and Circular Economy Program at the Foundation, and I'll be moderating today's conversation. Um, the previous sessions, we've focused on processes and partnerships to accelerate circular ma materials management and innovation. We've looked at corporate climate action, which is a critical component of the United Nations Sustainable Development Agenda, and we've uh, discussed tactics for achieving effective collaboration toward these circular and climate goals. Today's conversation is focusing on the future of sustainable investment and reporting, and the structure and the themes that are underpinning this discussion, as well as the stakeholders that uh, are contributing to it, who you see on the screen and you'll hear from soon, uh, represent the efforts that are underway now between the Chamber and the Chamber Foundation to support members on their approach to the ESG ecosystem and we'll be engaging with stakeholders on ESG related priorities. And today's session topic is in direct response to a work stream priority that emerged out of uh, chamber member feedback, uh, membership feedback about a year ago this week, actually, um, when the chamber launched the task force on climate actions. Uh, that task force is a forum to engage the chamber's membership of companies, trade associations, state and local chambers, specifically in the climate space. And the foundation has come in to work on ESG issues in partnership, in partnership with the chamber uh, and, and in partnership with those on the panel. So to inform the approach that we're taking, we've hosted several stakeholder roundtables and the themes that we've come up with or that we've heard from folks about in those roundtables is gonna kind of anchor the discussion that we're having today. We will also be producing a white paper on the learnings from these activities, the discussion, the takeaways, the input from all of you in 2021. And so stay tuned uh, for more on that. To set the context for today, just a little bit about what we've been hearing to be the drivers um, for increased uh, corporate attention on ESG themes, um, things such as legacy issues, increased C-suite attention, pressure and, and demand from consumers and employees, and a desire to get to much higher le levels of consistency and granularity around what reports are actually saying and communicating. We have also been hearing consensus around the pivot from ESG as an issue of interest to mission-driven folks. Um, to really being placed center stage in conversations. And these drivers are really having their moment now, um, largely because of COVID-driven reprioritization and also just the, the clear issue interconnectedness that is, um, that is arising around climate change and resilience and equity. Um, we're also seeing an increased interest in the data that we need in order to account for current and future factors and calls for greater cohesion and harmonization on behalf of companies that are overloaded with all of the frameworks and the demands that exist today. So today during Climate Week and in our work to follow, we're gonna to continue to drill down into the ways that different stakeholders are prioritizing and communicating ESG related information, um, the approaches that different stakeholders are taking um, to, to harmonize, to align, to work together, and the role of ESG initiatives as paths to resiliency and how that might be influenced um, in the current climate. So we really appreciated all of your input, um, those who registered and provided some feedback. And we do invite you to continue to put forward questions throughout the, the, the discussion. So you can do that in the chat box, which I believe to be on the right of your screens. Um, and this conversation is being recorded and, and, and participants are only in listen mode. So um, if you do wanna communicate, do so via the chat box. Now I wanna make sure to put faces to names so that we can get into the conversation. So without further ado, um, our panelists, so I'd like to welcome, include Eric Van Nostren, Head of Research for Sustainable Investments and Multi-Asset Strategies at BlackRock, Catherine Eby, Vice President of National Engagement and Strategy, Chief Sustainability Officer at Duke Energy and President of the Duke Energy Foundation, Leon San Sanders-Calvert, Head of Sustainable Investing at Refinitiv, and Sonia Gibbs, Managing Director and Head of Sustainable Finance at Institute for International Finance. Um, and we have some folks that are newer to the, their respective teams, not newer to ESG. So we will um, we will be kind to them and uh, and and uh, and not put anyone on the spot with uh, with overly complicated years long over uh, overviews of um, of their respective companies. But really excited by the strong team that we have joining us, and really looking forward to a good conversation on it. So. To start us off, I would like to put to you all, um, those that we have with us, the panelists, I'd like to introduce you all in the context of your own roles. Um, if you could just kind of comment on where in the ESG investment and in our disclosure, disclosure ecosystem you sit, um, both uh, from the perspective of your organization, 
um, or and or your kind of your role specifically in that organization. So maybe Eric, I'll start with you, and then we can uh, go kind of Eric, Catherine, Leon, and Sonia from there. Sounds great. Thanks so much, Stephanie, and it's good to be with all of you today. While I am new to my role, Stephanie, I am happy to be put on the spot nonetheless, and we'll just we'll see say, what happens. Wanna... Okay. We'll see what happens. Um, I, uh, I newly lead BlackRock's sustainable investment research efforts alongside our traditional multi-asset investment research efforts. And I'll highlight the reason we did that, the reason we put our sustainable and traditional research efforts in, in a lot of the same roles is really central to why I'm here today and, and our firm's approach, which is really to put sustainability at the center of our active investment platform and to really put our money where our mouth is in terms of showing that sustainability is, is part of the traditional investment ecosystem um, that we've been running for decades and that we're gonna hold that sustainable research to the same level of rigor and standards that we would hold any investment research in, in really any context. The, the decision to do that was driven by a commitment we made at a firm level, uh, kicked off at the start of this year with Larry Fink's letter to CEOs to keep ESG, to keep sustainability on a level with tradition, traditional investment metrics. And we wanna be very clear that we made that commitment because we think it's our duty as fiduciaries to recognize our investment view that sustainable firms will outperform in the decades to come. You know, as we transition to a low carbon economy, as, we, as markets gain a greater appreciation of stakeholder capitalism and related issues. So my, my team's focused on how to best measure sustainability and how to best structure investment views that are driven by that. To do that, we need good data and good reporting. So that's why I'm very excited to be a part of this conversation on how we can make sure all the parts of those ecosystems are, are working well together. And hi everyone, I'm Catherine Neby. I am another uh, newbie to, to Duke Energy. Uh, I have worked in sustainability and ESG related issues for around 20 years. I joined Duke Energy from Walmart where I formerly led our ESG work. So I'm quite familiar with the conversation and some of the challenges that we're all collectively having as we try and figure out what we measure, where we get started, how do we align different uh, disclosures and just the the increasing pressure that businesses uh, are under to to navigate this whole alphabet soup of, of frameworks and standards and just figure out what do we put out in into the mix. So excited to be here to to learn from this community of practitioners. So hi everyone, um, great to be here um, with this distinguished panel, of course. Um, I look after a few businesses for a company called Refinitiv. I, I'm hoping that most people are familiar with Refinitiv. Refinitiv is a relatively new name, 18 months or two years old. Um, but Refinitiv is the name effectively for the financial and risk division of what was Thomson Reuters, which was spun out a couple of years ago. Um, so it's a very large market data provider. Um, I run a couple of businesses for them, one of which is a business called Lipper, which is all about fund performance and fund data. Um, and, and sustainability, sustainable issues, ESG issues, actually becoming a more and more central part of that proposition. But I also run our invest, uh, our sustainable investing business. Um, and at the core of that, that's a lot of data assets. Um, at the core of it is a company ESG database covering uh, 9,000 uh, companies, 9,000 corporates, um, and their various ESG footprints um, with a lot of history around that. But it also includes, of course, sustainable financing. So looking at new bond issuance and new loan issuance, uh, we have carbon pricing capabilities and uh, and indeed we look at a macro level um, uh, data as well at the country level. And we do that primarily for the institutional finance audience. So the, the like the likes of Eric's organizations are, are, our, are our main clients, feeding data into them in order to allow them to allocate capital in, in more optimal ways. Sonia, over to you. There we go. Find the unmute button. That's always the first step. Uh, just for those of you who, who may not be familiar with the IIF, we are a global association of financial firms and the whole kind of financial ecosystem. Uh, so everyone from large asset managers, global folks like BlackRock, uh, to we've got law firms, consultancies, and of course, Refinitiv is, is an IIF member. So, so what we do is two things. We do research. We do everything we do is is based on research. We do quite a lot in in sovereign debt work, in policy work. 
Now, ESG and sustainability specifically has just mushroomed in the last decade or so. I mean, I can I can think back to, to five years ago, you'd have to kind of drag people kicking and screaming to a, a meeting about green finance or green bonds. And now, you know, our working group is over 200 people in size and growing rapidly. So you both have the top down steer from the policymakers and regulators that's driving this, but also the kind of bottom up demand from, from clients that, that we're all seeing. So it's, it's made this a really big focus for, for what we do. So we're advocates on the international level. So we don't lobby in any particular country, but we're working mainly with the global standard setters. So the Ball Committee, IAIS, IOSCO and, and all of that. Uh, but also with the Network for Greening the Financial Systems, or NGFS, uh, and with support for the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures, TCFD. Just put out those acronyms there in case they come up later in the game. I'm sure you're all familiar with them. So, so our role is very much at the international level. Great. Thanks. Thanks to all of you. I think, as you can see, it's a pretty diverse and, and sort of synergistic set of perspectives in terms of ways into this conversation. So um, I think what I'll do is maybe just bucket us around sort of getting some context framing in and starting to talk a little bit more specifically about some of the drivers. Then I'd love us to get into some of the things that we're observing around collaboration and efforts to, um, to work together towards something that is meaningful. And then uh, we will uh, we'll want to kind of have um, a look at where we are with respect to what's been going on for the past four to six months and really where we see um, this ecosystem headed. So that's kind of how we're gonna how we're gonna wind through uh, in the next uh, 45 minutes or so. But the first question I might put uh, Eric first to you, and then Sonia, please feel free to weigh in from the financial side or or otherwise on what are the some of the some of the different sectors looking for in ESG analytics. So has this has this you know what where is it now? Has this changed? Kind of where what are your perspectives on where where that's headed? And and Sonia maybe you know too you could share some of what you've been doing around. Um, around the mapping on this, um, that would be, I think, a great way to start. So, Eric, over to you. Sure, I think it's a, I think it's a very well timed question, Stephanie, because I do think it's a it's a moment of of great change in how we think about that question right now. I think the way the way I characterize at least at least the work we've done at uh, at BlackRock to date over the past couple of years in this space is that relative to the full spectrum of sustainable issues. Our work has been heavily biased towards toward climate and environmental issues, toward the, the E, if you will. Um, and I think there are reasons for that, you know, related to the point of this conversation. I think the data is easier to manage in the E space. Um, it is easier for um, investors with quantitative data-driven bents in other contexts to map themselves into a into measuring climate risk and transition risk and and, and broader environmental concerns because the data is a bit easier to work on. Um, and in some sense, it's been the low hanging fruit in that regard. And we've got a number of strategies that try to do that in, in what I hope are creative ways. But that, that's not a very good reason to, uh, you know, to, to center the focus of the forward research agenda where there's been data availability. I think we have seen an upswing in non-environmental sustainable data, thanks, frankly, to a lot of the organizations represented on this call, um, but also in places where we're looking to include artificial, excuse me, um, alternative data sources um, using, you know, to, to, to forgive me for using a couple investing buzzwords, but AI and machine learning on, on some of those alternative data sets are even very helpful in the, um, in the sustainability context. So I think it's a moment of great expansion beyond the climate work that's been in, in done in depth so far. Right, I could just chime in there with a, with a few things. Um, you know, it, it, it's clear across the world um, that a tremendous step up in demand for climate risk assessment tools, and all of those are based on, on data. You can't do anything without, without fundamental data. And obviously this is not least because regulators in a lot of jurisdictions are asking, and I'm speaking here for the financial sector, but it, I'm sure it's the same elsewhere, asking for firms to do a better job assessing and disclosing their, their climate risks specifically. And in some places, a growing focus on beyond climate risks like natural capital, biodiversity, more demand there as well. And I think, you know, in part, the, the adoption of the TCFD recommendations on disclosure really varies a lot across geographies. 
And But even in mature economies, only about 60% of firms are complying with TCFD recommendations. And in emerging markets, it's less than, than 30%. Um, and part of what's driving this is, is a demand for better processes for risk management. So a lot of this is about risk management. Um, and less than half, we've done a survey on the practices of, in, in climate finance of our, of our member firms, less than half of the, the respondents said that they have an explicit process for climate risk management in-house. And um, less than 20% of those have really integrated this process throughout their organization. So there's a, there's a long way to go. Uh, shadow carbon pricing is another area, I think, where you're seeing more demand for the necessary data and tools that you need to do this. Um, only of, of, the, of the group that we surveyed, uh, which is quite global and extensive, um, only about 20% of them are using internal shadow carbon pricing in their planning or decision making, and about 15% said they have plans to do so. So again, a lot of ground to, to cover here. And we also found good progress on reporting scope one and scope two, greenhouse gas emissions, but a long way to go on, on, on financed emissions. Um, so about a third of the firms that we surveyed are looking at metrics like carbon footprint, carbon intensity, green share, brown share, exposure to coal, fossil fuels, and so on. But not many are assigning targets as yet. So at the end of the day, you've got a, a strong demand for a better toolkit to do this. Uh, and a lot of data and service providers out there, a whole ecosystem developing. Um, and they're offering a big range of products with varying degrees of, of, of granularity and, and detail. And maybe, Stephanie, it's a good segue to your next question and, and Leon's work. Uh, you see, you're, you're ratting me out for having a, a set of questions that we all know about, but we'll, we'll, we'll go off the cuff on parts two. But yes, good segue to the next Secret question. Out. <laughs> that we had discussed, which is a, which is to Leon actually, just in terms of before we get into some of the um, ways we can kind of enhance the um, what data is telling us on a macro level, what can ESG related data and disclosures help enable? Um, if you could stop, speak a little to that. Yeah, happy to. Um, and I, you know, I'm going to struggle to say anything which isn't sort of obvious here, but I'll I'll do my best anyway. Um, look, I guess the the core foundation of someone like Refinitiv, not just Refinitiv, but people like Refinitiv, market data providers, is you know fundamentally to drive transparency into markets in order to allow for optimization of capital generation and capital allocation. And in some sense, this is no different. We, we, we there's a danger of, of treating this sort of you know overly different, um, uh, overly differently, and there, and there isn't a need to do that. There is still a need to optimize the capital generation and allocation, and you can't do that without good data. Um, and so, of course, you know, collecting data, um, I was delighted, actually, uh, Sonia, what you just said around fundamental data, and that is actually one of the critical core foundations of how we treat ESG data. We treat it as fundamental data, notwithstanding the emerging trends in alternative data that Eric referenced a second ago, but treating it as fundamental data. So you don't treat it as sort of uh, any less seriously and with any less kind of clarity of auditability, any less clarity of transparency than you would other financial metrics. And so sometimes it's useful, I sometimes refer to ESG data as uh, material non-financial data because I don't want to make a strong distinction about it as, as, as you know sometimes is implied um, in terms of distinguishing it from financial data. You want the same level of auditability, you want the same level of clarity around that data, how it was derived, what methodologies were used um, and you want to be able to integrate it fundamentally into numerous different types of models. You want to be able to integrate it into impact models but you also want to be able to integrate it into risk generating models like Sonia was referring to, or even alpha generating models. And to do that, you have to treat it as consistent with the other types of data, typically the financial data that you use for that. So, you know, fundamentally, I don't think you can do much in this space without having really good data. Um, it's it's the foundation of it. It's it's a, it's a, a, at the core. Yeah, cool. And we actually did get a, a question on that that came in previously. So we will try and circle back to, to some of those points around sort of alpha generation and um, what is material and non-financial uh, toward the end of the conversation. But Catherine, over to you. You've got a different perspective as a data provider. What is your sense on kind of this landscape as far as the value of companies being part of the conversation, um, specifically Duke Energy, but obviously you've had um, more experience than that. So could you speak a little bit uh, about some of your observations there? Yeah. And I think I might have a slightly different perspective than my my peers on this call. Um, so just taking a step back, I've been working in this field for a really long time, and I've always viewed how companies navigate ESG issues as being 
part and parcel of a company's strategy. I never saw it as being separate from, from, from kind of the pure financials. And so on the one hand, I really welcome this shift and acceleration on um, trying to figure out how do you measure and manage ESG issues. Uh, I think there is a little bit of um, a mad rush for more and more data. And, and I think from the, the perspective of someone who's been trying to, to figure out what do we put out there um, and the narrative that we want to say and what we want to identify is really significant. To me, having a really solid understanding of your business, not only from a risk standpoint of, of what are, is out there that you really need to be concerned about on the ESG front, but also where are you seeing future growth and value being generated, I think is equally important. And so when I think about the kind of disclosures I wanna make, I mean, I would say one, first and foremost, disclosure is part and parcel of trust. And so you do need to be sharing a lot of information, but I think I'm also at that same time very cautious that, that if I'm putting information out into the public domain, I wanna make sure that it is information that I think is decision useful and then I'm taking into account who the stakeholder is and who the audience is that would receive that information because the conversation I would have uh, with an investor, the issues I would identify, the risk, the opportunities I would identify, the proof points in terms of data that I would cite would fundamentally be very different from say an NGO or a member of a local community uh, where we happen to have operations and I think to some degree right now, um, as, as a, having now worked for a couple of companies that are, are, are trying to navigate this, just being really thoughtful in, in terms of what you're putting out there, how you're putting out there and who you're communicating to is, is, is really important. I think the other thing that I would just highlight that I, is helpful and Eric, your comment kind of spoke to it a little bit, um, but I always like to think about what is an input, an output, and an impact metric uh, for disclosure. Inputs are, generally speaking, easier to measure. Um, outputs get a little bit harder, and impact is really, really hard, and in my mind, the kind of holy grail of what we're all trying to drive towards. Um, so I can, for example, and, and we wrestled with this when I was at Walmart, I can, for example, identify how much money we're spending per associate in terms of workforce training for future of work. Um, I can cite as an output the number of relative promotions that we've seen in that you know, subset. Impact, how are we, how is Walmart helping to navigate um, economic mobility issues? And if I could figure that one out, <laughs> I think we'd all, all really rejoice. And, and so um, anyway, I'll, I'll stop there, but, but I, I'm, I'm so heartened by this conversation. No, it's great. Well said. And, and I, I think with that frame, we can kind of start to go into a little bit of what we're specifically um, working towards. So maybe, Eric, I'll bring you back in um, with a question around some of your efforts alongside IIF, actually, and, and WEF's IBC and, and others. You guys have been calling for some simplified um, sustainable investment terminology to enhance transparency and trust um, for those that are actually thinking about factoring these kinds of uh, investment decisions into what they're doing. So could you talk a little bit about those efforts and, and the relevance of them? Yeah, I mean, I think those the, the effort to standardize our language around this is relevant, uh, basically, not to give too short an answer, but for, for the reasons Catherine just kind of outlined in hers, which is that there is, and particularly when quantitative data people like me start talking about this, it, I recognize it sounds like I'm just clamoring for all kinds of different data that I can throw into a big algorithmic pot and come out with something exciting. That doesn't work in sustainability. We, we don't just need more data, we need good data. And it doesn't often need to be a lot. It needs to be um, data of the sort that we understand and that our clients understand and that our different stakeholders understand. I think one of the thresholds to that, to be quite honest, is non-standardized language in the way we talk about this, you know, an awful lot. Um, and we, you know, we put out a paper at the start of the year trying to propose, propose the beginnings of a framework, at least in the investment world, for how we can um, 
you know, differentiate impact investments from quote ESG investments from quote screened investments and such. Um, and a lot of that there, I do think we're in a good trend of, of standards emerging in that regard. But I think that's one specific example of the general phenomenon of we have to resist the temptation to excitedly throw all the different numbers around that we can we can find and to make sure that we're being good fundamental investors too and not just excited um data consumers and thinking hard about the real um the real substance behind each each input. Yeah. Any comments on that before I kick it over to Leon? Because I think that's a perfect segue to uh relevance of data. But yes, Sonia, please. Just uh, just a quick uh, comment on, on this here. I mean, the, the standardization of, of, of terminology really matters, right? Because to have a common language and a common understanding, if you don't have that, it's a real barrier to scaling up investment. And as this kind of whole oversight of sustainable finance moves forward and we move from kind of voluntary arrangements to hardwiring things into a mandatory format, it's far better that the industry sort of settle on how they view what what the best kind of framework is for something like standardized terminology before you know the official sector do it for us. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Agree with that. Yeah, and Leon, you guys have also been working with IIF on um, sort of an inaugural sustainable data alliance, um, which is looking at how to accelerate access to capital for sustainable objectives um, uh, by improving the reliability of data. So, could you tell us a little bit about? why that effort i mean does that suggest that they that companies currently um that folks lack sufficient data or or access to capital to to make these transitions and um and how can how can this kind of uh reliability increase capital flows to meet um kind of sustainable development agenda objectives for example sure so look i think I, I'll, I guess I'll clarify a couple of things. The first is that the Future Sustainable Data Alliance, which you know we've led with um, you know with support from WEF and, and, and many others, quite frankly, yeah, essentially uh, you know a coalition of the win it, of the willing, I think is how we defined it, is not really designed to try and create new standards. There are enough people trying to create standards out there and doing a reasonably good job of it. And quite frankly, we're adopting those standards ourselves. We're mapping our own data to things like SASB and TCFD and GRI and UNSDGs and things like that in order to make our data usable. I'm amazed that the word materiality hasn't come up yet um, in terms of identifying which data is material, but it's exactly central to what you know, both Catherine and Eric were both dis discussing and describing. Um, and the magic M word in ESG sort of you know, is always is always present with us and, and you know, being clear about what is material and what's not and, and how that depends on different sectors is really important. The future of Sustainable Data Alliance that was not set up to be another attempt to be another standard setter. I, I don't think that's, that's, that's what we intended with that at all. And, and that's certainly not how it's playing out. It's really designed to respond to what we hear from the financial markets, particularly the asset management community and the asset owner community, um, where there are there are areas where there is uh, data sort of there is lacking in data clarity. Um, it doesn't exist today. Uh, companies don't know how, how to report on it. Um, it's not it's not possible to get hold of it. Um, and um, you know how how important is some of that data which we'd like to see which doesn't exist. Um, and, and how material do we think those kind of gaps are to being able to make really good capital allocation decisions? So let me sort of see, I'll put a little bit of meat on the bones, but I'll, you know, I don't want to take up too much time. But the sort of things that have come out of that actually reflect a little bit what Eric was dis discussing earlier around things like alt data. So this sort of surge of AI driven data. Um, you know, around sentiment analysis. A lot of ESG data is very static. Um, it, it's not, it, it doesn't update on a regular basis. And so can we get a sort of a data set which allows for, for sort of a more real time or at least higher frequency um, inputs? Um, and sort of satellite imagery is another good example of that, of, of looking at emissions and things from satellites. Um, the other kind of um, issues or thematic issues that have come out of the, the, the dialogue and which we continue to work through are things like, uh, biodiversity. So Eric earlier talked about the issue of, of, of climate and how we're relatively robust and mature in terms of thinking about how you start to manage to transition risk and, and factor in sort of carbon emissions and climate anal uh, carbon analytics into uh, into sort of risk management processes. But you know, trying to qualify and understand what impacts companies have on biodiversity and indeed what are the downstream consequences of that and how might you internalize and quantify that. Um, that externality 
is really non-trivial, is really hard to do. And it doesn't really exist today to anything like the same level of maturity as, let's say, the carbon data does. So uh, and not that there isn't more maturity to go in terms of carbon data as well. But it's those sorts of things which have come out of the future of Sustainable Data Alliance. So in an attempt to be another standard setter, um, let's let's just drive home the things that, that are trying to, you know, the, the, the parties that are trying to create those standards already and doing a good job of that, but rather to identify what are the future needs of data and, and how do we influence that discussion in a positive way. Yeah, and, and to the point about there being uh, a lot of folks working on standardization, we've just seen this week um, the kind of big four and the shift uh, to the 21 core metrics that they're putting forward as, as common standards. So, uh, and we, you know, so I think there was news of, of GRI and SASB doing a better sort of stepping up their efforts of really clarifying the commonalities and the differences of, of their standards. So, Sonia, I'd want to put this one to you and then I'd welcome others' comments around kind of, you know, if uh, IF has been ha, has been really urging kind of accelerated progress on framework standardization um, in order to respond to you know market disruption and and, and a lot of other things. So what um, what is your opinion about some of these efforts that we've been seeing more recently and 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 where do you think that's going to be um, taking us? If you could weigh in on that first, and then again, I'd, I'd love to uh, get others' thoughts. Well, I think they're exactly what's needed, both the kind of recent announcement from GRI, SASB, and others about their search for, for commonality and alignment, and then the project that was uh, launched in, in Davos this year with the World Economic Forum, the Common Metrics Project with the support of the big four accounting firms. All of these are really valuable efforts. I think our our main gripe, I guess, is that we we want them to be sort of talking to each other and, and well aligned because you, you you really do not want fragmentation here when the landscape is still voluntary. Yes, and as we move from sort of voluntary to mandatory frameworks, these these principles are really important. So you know there are multiple frameworks and also expectations. You know I'd point out that in many jurisdictions they're starting to think about how they want their companies to report. And the last thing we want is a world where you know Singapore wants you to do it one way and London wants you to do it another, and you've got all all of a sudden you have 40, 40 reports to fill out on the on the same data. That's the last thing we want. So I think, you know, we really want to ensure consistency and, and comparability across markets and avoid this kind of fragmentation. So ideally, in the long run, what you'd end up with is something like a, a generally accepted international non-financial reporting standard. You know, and the, the European, Europe is, as ever, you know, way out in front on these. But the approach that they take, you know, with all due respect and, and comprehensive and wonderful and detailed as it is, might not necessarily work across all jurisdictions. So I think we may be really at a, an inflection point here. I mean, we may be in a different world in, in the United States, you know, come, come election day, it could be a different landscape here. And that would really change how these international standard setting bodies work together. So something something to, to think in mind. But just a couple of things to think about when, when you're thinking about a harmonized global framework, you know, the, the materiality is, the, the M word, as, as Leon brought up, and metrics, governance, and, and it, what's important to note is that it should be built upon voluntary ESG disclosure frameworks that are already in place, right? I mean, we do not want the, the wheel to be reinvented. The, the wheel exists in, in multiple formats already. Uh, so we're, we're actually calling on the international standard setting bodies to take steps themselves toward a harmonized cross-sectoral ESG disclosure framework. So that's the G20 the Financial Stability Board, building on the TCFD and, and these voluntary efforts. So, so these are really important initiatives. Well, cool. others, comments, anything before we move on from that? I would just um, jump in and, and, and underscore, I mean, this is a, please believe, if, there, if you could boil down to 25, 50, I'll take 100 metrics that companies are required to disclose and there was universal alignment over what those are, um, I am all for it. Um, but I think the point Leon made earlier shouldn't have been um, missed, which is for a lot of this stuff, measure, measurement just isn't there. The, 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 the knowledge, the, the accounting principles, it just, it, it's completely, it, not there. Um, I remember, so before I joined Walmart, I was at the World Wildlife Fund, and I remember 
fairly recently, WWF is working on a white paper to help define what a forest is. So if we haven't aligned about the definition of a forest, how on earth are we going to hold companies accountable for delivering against net zero deforestation commitments? Um, and then the way that you can measure that work is primarily historically been through certification. Well, the leading companies that are tackling deforestation are adopting jurisdictional approaches, which is not related to certification, not really. And so, so I think we, on the one hand, need these common metrics and we need to push ourselves and our thinking forward and what they are. Um, but I also think we need to just kind of accept, in, in my view, what is the real challenge here, which is for a lot of this stuff, we're just not quite there yet in terms of having information we can disclose. And I guess a second point that I would, I would make that I, I think is really important is um, one of the things that I appreciate about some of the standards is that their focus is really on what matters to companies, what is a risk, an ESG-related risk uh, for companies, and I think that's important. I think people need to know that. Um, however, other standards talk about how the companies matter to big issues like climate change, and I think if we're just solving for the one and not thinking about the other, we're, we're at a real loss. So now that I'm at Duke Energy, we have a history of disclosing information. Um, a lot of information is out there in the public domain against all kinds of standards and frameworks. Uh, but if that's all we're doing um, and not taking into account our net zero goal by 2050 um, and not pushing other utilities to adopt uh, aggressive, ambitious climate targets, and we're kind of not, not looking at the complete picture of what we need companies and, and investors to really incent and drive towards. Yeah, so Kat, I'm just staying with you for a second and you can feel free to punt to a person of your choosing if, if you feel that someone might have something interesting to comment here, but where do you see kind of, do you see any gaps in the conversations and collaborations around um, kind of how quickly ESG considerations are being adapted and embedded? Is there anything that, you know, kind of, is there a, a lucky lever or a way to kind of um, accelerate progress through closing some of those gaps. Just curious to hear your opinion and, and, and or anyone else's um, on that particular piece around how to, how to engage stakeholders and make sure that we're doing so thoughtfully. Yeah, I mean, I have a lot of thoughts and I, I, I would really be curious about what my peers on the call have to say. Um, it feels to me like we're starting to have very um, robust conversations with investors across companies. Um, about that question of materiality and what is relevant. Um, from the, the perspective of a company, we, we certainly want to be responsive to our investors, but we also want to be responsive to our stakeholders, um, to the communities and to the customers and, and things of that nature. So to me, it feels like there is an opportunity for just increasing dialogue about what are the state of the challenges out there and how do we need companies to respond uh, and what are some of the challenges and the barriers to, to that robust uh, response. So I'd start there, but there are a lot of, there's a lot of opportunity, I think, out there. Eric, Leon, others, comments? Yeah, well, one point I'd throw out there is, um, you know, we, and this is related to Catherine's point, in, in our conversations with clients, particularly a lot of our conversations with clients around the, the, the rollout we did at the start of this year, where we said we're, we're elevating this to a real part of our general investment agenda. Um, you know, it won't surprise you to learn that a lot of those client conversations were met with a fair amount of skepticism. Um, and that, that skepticism, frankly, is a, is a healthy thing. It's not something I reject. I don't malign skeptics about this. As fiduciaries, we need to be skeptical of, of, of new ideas. But I do think the conversation needs to shift beyond are these things important? Because I think we do have the data this year. Um, and I think COVID, um, provided an interesting natural, uh, natural experiment to kind of explore the way that sustainability performs in financial markets in times when real resilience is needed, and happy to talk more about that later. But I think the conversation needs to shift to the next level down from is this important, where I think the, 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 the jury's back. I think the data is clear there. Um, to, to these questions that others were citing about what does sustainability really mean? How does our measurement um, you know, how we can measure this in smarter and smarter ways. There was, I'm sure many of you saw, there was a, um, you know, an, an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal this week that pointed out that the low correlation among a lot of 
and a broad ESG scores might be a reason to be skeptical of the enterprise. I don't think that's a reason to be skeptical of the enterprise. I think that's a reason to invest more resources in, in frankly, what our groups are working on together now, which is getting to the, getting to the end of that measurement road. And frankly, as an investor, um, low correlation among these data is an opportunity to come up with new ideas to, to figure out which one's right. And that, that I think is something that's a real plus for, uh, for our collective efforts here. If I could just add briefly, Stephanie, to, to that one is, one is, it's kind of a chicken and egg problem that we've got here, right? Because we are not going to have consistent, <clears throat> usable, decision useful data until it's mandatory, right? I mean, if it's, if it's a voluntary standard, it's going to be piecemeal and fragmented, and that's just is what it is. However, at the same time, you know, the pushback is that you can't do that disclosure until you have the, the necessary tools and, and, and data to do it. So it's very chicken and egg. And we're going to be in this kind of uncomfortable transition sort of period for some time, I think. So I want to just for the sake of time kind of move us into where we are now. Uh, maybe, um, Catherine, starting with you, you know, I think the effects of COVID-19 have really exposed some of the inequities that have long been present in society. So I would be curious to hear how you all are seeing an increase in hu human capital management and some of the S considerations um, more quickly entering the conversation um, and how companies can be thinking about um, these kinds of considerations in our in our kind of post-COVID uh, new normal. So any thoughts on that, uh, that piece? Yeah, I mean, I would start with um, for Duke Energy, we've been uh, focused on human capital, diversity and inclusion, and other related metrics, particularly around worker safety for many, many years. So uh, it's not really a new conversation or a new issue. Um, and coming from Walmart, I would say, you know, very consistent um, in, in uh, focus on human capital. I, I think, um, I think what's interesting to me about COVID, setting aside the fact that it's a a horrific global pandemic um, is how it's really shown a light on um, particularly certain sectors of the economy uh, that are really vital uh, as we think about what creates an enabling environment for a, a resilient economy overall. And I've been fortunate to work for Walmart, which was an essential and is an essential provider of service and now Duke Energy, where uh, when I think about um, what is really necessary um, as we think about all sorts of issues like economic development, equity, sustainability, it's, it's really about how we um, keep the lights on and, and the power rates uh, affordable and reliable, um, same time tackling some big issues. So, um, so I think what has been helpful about COVID, not that I think much is helpful about COVID, has been um, that it has really shown a light on um, how important strong relations with your workforce is, how important good ties to your communities where you operate, that you rely upon, um, and your customer base. And so I, to me, it, it, it's helping to accelerate the focus on the S in a way that I think has historically been missing because to Eric's earlier point, the data for climate was a little bit easier to get, um, and so, so for me, I, I, I think it's it's been helpful in just furthering and advancing the conversation and the emphasis on the end. And Eric, I want to point to you because I know you all have been working on a lot of storage activities with respect to where you're um, you're moving attention. Can you speak to some of those and and sort of what outcomes you've been seeing? Uh, you know, I think you all have been working on this for longer than COVID has been with us. Um, so I would just be curious to hear your observations over the course of time that these that these areas of focus and priorities for you all. Yeah, um, yeah, no, you're certainly right that stewardship is not a is not a new game for BlackRock, um, and we spend an awful lot of our time focused, uh, at, you know, as a, as a as a large manager of passive investments in our engagement with portfolio companies, which is something we view as um, you know as an important part of our corporate purpose. Um, and, and by the way, we view that stewardship very much as an, as an investment activity. We think it's an important part of our, um, you know, of our engagement with the broader, broader ecosystem. Um, and certainly, uh, while well, stewardship is, uh, has, has been around for a long time for us, 
um, the and sustainable issues as part of that has also been around for a long time. There certainly has been an inflection point this year, both in the extent to which we're engaging with companies on this and the extent to which our portfolio companies are engaged, are, are proactively talking to us about these issues. Um, ours, we, we lay out as a firm six big priorities for uh, the way we the way we engage with firms on the stewardship front, um, assessing board quality, assessing environmental risk and opportunities, um, assessing corporate strategy from a from an S and G perspective and a little bit of E2, um, uh, assessing compensation policies for long termism. Um, you know something that I think uh, is a, is an older term in in the, the the corporate dialogue, but is really central to a lot of a lot of these trends and human capital management. These are all things we try to measure um, as investors for the way we you know the way we make active investment calls on behalf of our clients. But we leverage a lot of the same data to communicate with our portfolio companies and understand better how they're developing and, and how we can help. And, and, and for, you know, Sonia and Leon, just to bring you back into the conversation, but Eric and Catherine would be curious if you have opinions on this as well. You know, how have you all seen um, companies begin to effectively account for issue interconnectedness in their investments and in communicating it in their reporting. Are you seeing um, that people are getting better at that or getting better tools? Is there still a long way to go? Just, you know, kind of what are your perspectives on, um, on how that's happening? I might just start with a, a, a quick observation that one thing that we found quite interesting is the role of the chief sustainability officer in assessing and, and driving this interconnectedness. So we're actually working on quite an interesting study we'll be publishing soon on, on exactly that, because you, you really need that kind of central point. Otherwise, it's, it's all completely disconnected. You have people doing the analytics, the risk management, the CSR, you know, the, the global public policy piece, and all of those need to be interlinked. But, but it's definitely growing, and people are revamping their entire organizational structures to, to account for this. So, look, just in a, an additional thought, I, I think really just sort of bouncing off really what Catherine said um, uh, earlier, one of the things that COVID-19 has, has done is provide a level of clarity as to, and I'm going to steal a line here from Sarah Breeden, who, you know, worked for Mark Carney and led the climate team at Bank of England, uh, leads the climate team at Bank of England. She said, um, issues like climate risk, but not only climate risk, and this is where COVID-19 comes in, um, are impossible to divest from or diversify away from. They, they, are, they are not possible to avoid. So they have to be internalized. They have to be quantified and they have to be internalized. Um, and I think that COVID-19 has made that very, very clear, that where there are very large social or humanitarian crises, it is not possible to manage to sort of ignore them or pretend that they don't exist or not factor them in. And so it forces then this issue of, well, look, if you could, if you were able to predict these things, if you're able to predict humanitarian crisis or environmental crises, which are likely to become humanitarian crises in, in, on a long enough timeline, um, and you can factor those into the investment um, process, then how how could you not, with with a level of sort of fiduciary responsibility, for like how would you not do that, um, given the given the massive impact, the global economic impact that they can have? So this focus on the S of ES and G has sort of grown quite significantly over the course of the last few months, um, and and indeed you know supported as well by the other thing, the other important thing that happened, particularly in the US, not where I'm based, but, but particularly in the US, which was you know the Black Lives Matter movement and the focus that, that brought on the S as well. So the demand for data that we are receiving as a, as a data provider of this type of data for things like you know race and ethnicity data we do a very good job of diversity inclusion data around gender uh, particularly and, and we actually just last week released our, our new diversity and gender ranking and lots and lots of focus on that that's great but the demand for race and ethnicity data is growing but of course that's not being as collected as robustly by companies and it's not straightforward for companies to collect because individuals don't necessarily have to report that information to their to their companies so you know there is a there is a, a sort of a, a process and, and a, an evolving process that they're still relatively mature in that space but the demand for that data and the likely growth of that data set, um, I, I certainly, I certainly, you know, expect to see over the course of the coming years. Yeah, and Leanna, so I'm going to take a few questions now, and I'll just kind of circle around. And, and before we move off of you, and I'd like if I could just ask that your answers be tight, because I want to end with a couple of things um, uh, that I think, well, they always 
things that make me feel better about where we're headed. So if, selfishly, since I'm moderating, I'll get to uh, play that card. But first, uh, Leon, a question for you um, that came in before, and you had mentioned this earlier, sort of alpha generation. Is that the primary primary driver behind some of this integration um, and interconnectedness that, that Sonia cited? And, and what kind of what are the primary drivers um, behind integration and investments? I, I wouldn't say that alpha generation is the primary. I, I, don't, I don't feel the need to sort of rank them, if you like. Um, you can, I think, and lots of people are, lots of our customers are using data to support alpha generation. They are also using data to support risk management. They are also using data to support impact. I, you know, I think that the most sophisticated invest, investors, the most sophisticated asset management uh, firms are doing all of that. And to be clear, that sophistication plays itself out. They're using different data points to drive for different outcomes. They're factoring in different data points into different models to drive for those different outcomes. So depending on what you want your sustainable investing strategy to be, you're going to look at the data slightly differently. and You're going to want slightly different outcomes from it and slightly different inputs into it. There we go. Was that short and clipped enough? That was short and sweet and uh, and well said. Yep, thank you. And Eric, to you, uh, you saw, I think, the question that came through on data comparability um, across the portfolio. Can you speak a little bit to that? I know that's a, a longer a longer answer, but you're too cent for Yeah, no, and I, sure. And I, I alluded to this earlier. I think the um, I, it's absolutely right to call it a challenge right now that um, there are, and I think this is empirically true, often low correlations between different providers um, assessments of kind of broad high level sustainable data um, and i think a big part of the research effort which again goes to this measurement point it, it has to be about about um, getting better clear understandings of the of the methodologies at issue but that's a very healthy process for this you know still kind of newish field in the sense that we're still need to come to a consensus as an industry on how to measure a lot of these things. And I apologize uh, for folks that did not know what the question was. It was about how do you compare kind of, um, you know, differences across different industries in terms of being able to look at this and make decisions. So, um, uh, Sonia, this, this will be quick. How do folks know whether or not, or how do folks find kind of the publicly available? I know some of your, um, um, your research uh, are behind kind of uh, wall paywalls and things like this. Are there things that people can access to learn more about where you guys are, are tracking and what you're doing? Um, a lot of our data actually is is outside, or a lot of our research is Great. outside of the payroll on, on this topic. But I would also point to efforts that are being made, including by the Network for Greening the Financial Systems, about developing something like a, a public place for, for data and information to live that, so that it's more easily accessible. That was quick. All right. And then I want to go back to just kind of where we kind of where we're going from where we're, where we are currently. Um, you know, Catherine, maybe this is a question for you around kind of the biggest gains that you think or that kind of you see us making um, towards some of the share objectives that you've heard folks on the on the panel today. And, and you've obviously been been hearing about for a long time now. Kind of where do you think um, we'll be in a decade uh, as far as, uh, you know, kind of progress on on these efforts? Um, I can say where I hope we'll be in a decade. That's, that's, um, I, I mean, mean, I can't call you on it because there's no, <laughs> I'd just be curious, kind of looking ahead, where do you hope we'll be? Yeah. I mean, well, this is the decade that matters for so much. So this is where we need to be. Um, it's where I hope we, we will be. But I think we need to do two things simultaneously. One, we do need to understand uh, the risks that are posed at an individual enterprise level for ESG issues. I think people need to understand how our company is really um, working uh, in their specific sectors on issues that are, are material and relevant and, and getting them right and managing them to the best of their ability. I think at that same time, if that's the only thing we do, if we're not thinking about how do we, we do the upside, how are these companies uh, responding to the big global challenges at the right pace and at the right scale, then, then we're just going to be kind of on this race to the bottom. I want to get us to the race to the top, which is which is really kind of that that value um, creation, solving big, big, huge, challenging global issues where we need everyone kind of working, uh, working together. I think a second thing that I hope we are able to resolve over the next year is, or next few years is just a, a better sense of risk. Um, I think right now we're using as a proxy for corporate performance on ESG dimensions. We're, we're using uh, newspaper articles and controversy 
Um, I think that we can dig into in a little bit more depth to understand is the risk cited if specific to the company or specific to the sector um, and how risky is it? I think it, it's, it's a little bit murky right now. Uh, and I think Great. there's a huge opportunity. Cool. And sorry to put you on the spot as a forecaster because no one is in fact that, though we try. So the last question that I selfishly said I wanted to save time for, and I'll model it, it's going to be quick. So just 15 seconds each, you know, what is the, what is it that keeps you hopeful, that keeps you wanting to work on these issues? Um, uh, for me, it's people and all of you. And, uh, but I'd be curious, like, what is the thing that kind of keeps you going? Uh, maybe Eric, first with you, Sonia, Catherine, and Leon, and then I'll wrap us up. Yeah, well, you stole my first answer, Stephanie, which is conversations like this one. Um, getting to learn about different perspectives on, on these, these issues that are not new, but, um, but benefit from bringing new people to the table has been, has been very, very exciting, and I expect that to continue a long time. So for, for, for us, you know, for me personally, we do a lot of work with emerging markets. And it's been very encouraging to see over the last several years an increasing realization that you need to factor ESG considerations into the capital flows that are going to emerging markets. And for example, things like their debt sustainability, they need to be thinking about ESG as well. So it's, that's been very encouraging. Um, I would say that, um, look, it, the challenges are great um, over the course of the next decade or more, um, but being at the center of um, data provision, standards provision, measurement, um, uh, you know, uh, risk ma risk management and, and impact management, this is central. This is this is how capital will be optimized in order to solve these problems. You know, why would you want to be anywhere else? Yeah. And for me, I mean, I came over to Duke Energy just a few weeks ago and used to work at Walmart and previous to that was at WWF working with Coca-Cola. Um, and I think working and seeing these large global um, organizations that operate at scale and have an impact, um, seeing them at the table, rolling up their sleeves, trying to figure out how they solve things like climate change, uh, it's just an extraordinarily powerful moment in time. Couldn't couldn't end on a better note. Totally, and and you all in your own rights, by the way. I mean, are just huge leaders in this space, and we're just, I'm really feel grateful to have all of you as part of uh, in our camp and in helping us get these things right and 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 be more helpful. So um, the ask to everyone listening in today too is um, for those that had kind of nuggets of of thoughts that came. During this conversation, we will be sending out a follow-up survey. We actually really, really care about the inputs. So please, please give us your thoughts, your inputs, your ideas, questions not answered. And we will bake that into programming next year. And we will make sure we use those, um, those pieces of insight to, to get these conversations um, progressed going forward. So Catherine, Leon, Eric, and Sonia, thank you again for your perspective today. Um, thanks to everyone who dialed in. And um, we'll look forward to continuing to work together. Happy Climate Week. Thanks, everybody. Thank Thanks, everybody.